I'd like to welcome you today to the Foreign Correspondence Club on behalf of the Board of Governors. Uh, my name is Keith Bredge from the Hong Kong Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and I'll be your host today on behalf of the Board of Governors Professional Committee. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. As always, please turn off your phones now. Uh, we do put these speeches up on YouTube, and it's such a shame for, uh, uh, for our guests who aren't able to make it here in person not to be able to hear a remark because somebody's phone goes off. Uh, let me also then remind you, we have two more events coming up in the next few days. Tomorrow from 7 to 8, it's not a dinner, it's just a, a new format we're experimenting with, a one-hour event on uh, 3D, it'll be on 3D printing. That's tomorrow, 7 to 8, we still have spaces for that. And then next Monday evening, we have a club dinner, and that will be Mike Chinoy showing the latest installment of his series of documentaries on American foreign correspondents in China. Uh, we've now already had, I think, five or six of them. This one will be on American foreign correspondence in China uh, around the year uh, 2000 in the series uh, that he's been doing. With that, let me introduce our speaker today. Professor Agawa is, uh, has for many years been known as one of Japan's leading thinkers on strategic and international legal issues. He has studied in the United States, also taught at uh, UVA and Georgetown. He's now at Keio University. He's also served as Minister of Public Affairs at the Embassy of Japan in Washington. Uh, he has followed with great interest the recent questions of the future direction of Japan's national security policy in Asia, and he's here to give his perspective on that. With that, please, please welcome him. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, and um, Keith, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here and have an occasion and chance to speak to you all. Uh, I will be speaking very briefly about this uh, subject matter, that is na Japan's national security policy uh, challenges in Asia. Uh, because time is limited, my purpose is to provoke you on some of the issues and, and and I get your attention so that you can ask me any questions that, that you might have. I don't guarantee that I'll be able to answer all these questions because I'm a private citizen and I'm just giving my impression of what's happening right now. Uh, but that I'll be happy to do that. And so in order to do that, that I will keep my remarks very short. And this is a sort of a size slideshow that, that I have prepared for you. Um, and this is called Upside Down Map of the Indo Asia Pacific region. I, you, you, you will know why I say that. Um, just about um, two weeks ago, the Maritime Self Defense Force had a, uh, they do this once every three years, and that is the Fleet Review 2015. And this is in commemoration of the establishment of the Self Defense Force after the war, and then the Army and Navy and Air Force take turns. And so that's why once every three weeks. We, we sh I shouldn't call them Navy and Army because the Japanese Constitution prohibits us from calling it uh, Navy J Army. It's prohibited to have any. So it's called officially Maritime Self-Defense Force, whatever. So this is the, the fleet review. And it's a great, wonderful event for us Navy lovers and, and ship lovers. Uh, and this sort of is interesting to see this year. It was interesting to see to this year's uh, fleet review for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the Maritime Self Defense Force is a very professional group, armed forces. And as you can see, the line here, two double files, uh, so straight. And as, as I know, as I know, to be straight on the sea is very difficult because of the wind and the current. And I understand this, this way of the fleet review. The Japanese Navy is the only one that continues to do this. I'm sorry that the Royal Navy doesn't do that, and I'm sorry that the US Navy doesn't do that. But on the seas, they are the reviewing fleet and, and inspectors fleet also. This, in, in the front, there, there's this new helicopter carrier called Ismo, and I didn't, I didn't want to show the whole thing because it's so big, I don't want to scare anybody. Uh, now, one interesting thing is that the three US vessels, naval vessels were with us. Two of them officially, and one in the background was USS Ronald Reagan, which came to Japan just very recently at the beginning of September to be 
uh, stationed in Yokosuka. You see how huge that ship is. And in fact, the Prime Minister Abe, who uh, officially presided over the naval fleet, uh, after uh, being on board one of the flagships of the Japanese fleet, flew to the USS Ronald Reagan and emphasized the closeness of US Navy and Japanese maritime self defense force. So that ship was in the background, and we were able to see that uh, huge aircraft carrier, one of the newest, to be cruising nearby. Now, uh, that's, that's just an introduction. And I will tell you that together with the US Navy naval vessels and together with the Japanese maritime self-defense war, about 40 of them, there were some guest uh, naval vessels, one from Australia, as, uh, Australian ships, Stuart. One from India, interestingly, and one from Korea, very significantly, you can tell something's happening there. And one from France also. France is a little surprising, but if you think about the fact that France has a forward presence in the South Pacific, and they are playing some role there. What's most interesting is that there was no, no Royal, Royal Navy vessel. Uh, the time changes, and they don't have any ship around. So that's where we are. And one other Navy that didn't send anything to this maneuver is Chinese Navy for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so that's the introduction. Now, I wanted to show you two, basically three maps to show you where we are now in terms of geopolitical situation. This is the sort of a Earth sent, uh, looking from the space where China is and the Far East is. China is huge. Japan is on the periphery of this great Chinese and Eurasian uh, mass. And Japan is in a unique position because it's so close to the Korean Peninsula, northern part of which is scary. And we are very close to China. And we're also close to Russia. And you know that. And this is the way that it looks like from, the, from far away. But it, you, you sort of change the map perspectives a little. This is the way that Australians claim and New Zealanders claim this is a correct map of the world. It's not upside down. It's a correct way of showing them. If you look at it and you notice several things. One is that Australia and New Zealand are in the center of the world. We tend to forget that. Number two is that if you take a look at the, the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean together, actually you realize that this is one big ocean. It's nothing like Atlantic and Pacific, but this is the way the two oceans are connected. It's open. It can go on through this, you know, uh, vast seas, east and west, and west and east, very easily. Uh, people tend to forget that, and uh, we tend to think that the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Actually, Prime Minister Abe has mentioned this thing a few times, and I think that this is a way of looking at where China is. If you take a look at it, Japan is on the left-hand side. Let me, let me show you. Uh, another thing that is very conspicuous here is that Japan is the closest to the United States among Asian countries. There's a natural reason why Japan is very close to Japan, uh, the United States, in, for, in terms of strategic reason. But the more, more significant is the fact that if you take a look at China this way, it's sort of positioned in such a way that to the west there is Japan, to the east there is India, and to the north is Australia. And I think this is interesting that if if from the Chinese perspective, I can understand why they want to keep South China Sea and East China Sea open to them. Regardless of whether they want to have it their own, but they do want to keep South China Sea and East China Sea safe and open. So if Japan and Australia and India cooperate with each other, together with the United States, that means something. But that's the end of my sort of a short presentation. And um, I like to say uh, that recently in connection with those situations, there were maybe three or four pieces of good news from my own perspective. 
and you may disagree on this thing. Number one is that uh, Japan's new security legislation was passed on September 14th, uh, or 14th September, as you say, in this part of the world, 2015. And there are lots of uh, uh, debates going on, still going on, on that piece of legislation. But essentially, in terms of what is happening in this part of the world, I think it's a good news that the Japan and the United States, together with the countries like India and Australia and other countries, we can cooperate more closely with each other in terms of security, deterrence, and everything else. Number two good news is TPP agreement, obviously. Uh, that solidifies the Pacific region as a one big uh, free market. And I think that Australia is part of it, and Japan is part of it, and the United States is part of it. And I think, looking back, it's a miracle that we have somehow reached an agreement. That's a very good, good news. Uh, number three, and this may be controversial, but I think that the fact that the USS Lassen uh, went through the 12 nautical mile zone uh, of the artificial island that China claims to be its territory was essentially good news. Not because America did something earthbreaking or not because America is now ready to take it seriously, but because the United States set the tone of this thing. Uh, here's our position. It's not your territory. We have the freedom to go through any part of the, the South China Sea without any condition at all. And we are seeing how China might react to that. But I understand that the United States Navy will continue to do this, perhaps weekly or a long time to come. I think it ought to be. And there were some questions as to whether the United States is ready to do that. Uh, and clearly, President Obama uh, decided to order Harry Harris to do that. Uh, as to whether this is going to be effective and credible, uh, there are some different opinions about that. But I think that in terms of setting a part, very clear sign and sending very clear sign, this is where we are now committed and this is where we should stop. It was a very, very great, clear sign. Amb ambiguity is dangerous, I think, in my opinion. And this is very clear. Number th four good news is that last night, uh, the, the top leaders of Japan, China, and Korea got together for the first time in three years. And uh, Japanese Premier met with uh, uh, Chinese Premier face-to-face. Uh, in the evening, and today I don't know where and how soon or what time, but the Japanese Prime Minister Abe is meeting with President Park, uh, two of them together. I think this is a very good news. My impression is that each one of them was behaving well uh, and uh, restrained, and they listened to each other, and they had some many things to say to each other, but. They were mostly on friendly terms, and they talked about positive things that they need to do together. And those are the four good news that is happening. Now, back to the security legislation. Uh, well, we have had lots of debates about this back in Japan. And people in Hong Kong may not appreciate the fact that actually, although the, the new security legislation was passed, uh, but uh, there was a very strong opposition to the passage of this new law. I don't know how much you know the background of this thing, and in order to talk about that, the, all the backgrounds, historical backgrounds and, and all these things, I have to spend another hour with you to just briefly uh, uh, talk about that. Just skipping all these, I think that my sense is that this new law is neither going to be a breakthrough nor a, a way back to the dangerous past, militarism, resurrection of Japanese militarism. I think more fairly, this is a very constructive and uh, reasonable, in my view, efforts on the part of Japanese to be more ready, more prepared, and more actively engaged in uh, peace and stability in the region. Uh, 
I think what's interesting is that uh, this is mostly about uh, reinforcing and, and making it more effective, uh, the security re relationship between Japan and the United States. Already, the alliance between Japan and the United States is very strong. The way in which they work together, particularly between the J American Navy and, and Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force is just staggeringly close. I mean, they work like brothers. And in fact, you have to remember that the USS Lassen uh, came down to the South China Sea from Yokosuka, where the, the, the US Navy is uh, almost permanently based. And it's a, such a strategic asset that the two countries have together. Uh, so the main purpose of the security legislation is to strengthen the alliance and making more uh, effective. In, in the previous years, there were all sorts of technical hurdles and obstacles for them to work together. And uh, this is because of the pacifist uh, tradition of Japan and Article 9. Uh, but I think now they can expect to be able to do more things together in a more effective way. Number two, I think this would allow Japan to be more actively engaged uh, in some security peace measures with like-minded countries, such as Australia and uh, India and others. The, the, the names of these like-minded countries is not, uh, are there, not there, but I think that to the extent that we have common interests and we have common value system and we have some basic value system together, I think we could work together and this law will enable us to do that. And number three, I think this will allow Japan more actively to be involved in international peace and both UN-sponsored uh, and non-sponsored peace and security measures and activities. Uh, previously, Japan's policy on PKO was so restrained that there, there were some very um, harsh and, and strict uh, restrictions on the use of uh, arms and that kind of thing. And, and it's even more strict, uh, more strict than the UN you know, standard of operations. But I think that this should allow. But having said that, I think I have to remind you that uh, there is, as I said, a strong pacifist, uh, post-war pacifist sentiment and sort of a isolationist sentiment still in Japan. I will not go into detail because of the time, but I think that uh, you have to know that even now, the opposition, uh, if uh, polls have shown that the about uh, 30 to 35% of the Japanese people support this legislation, and only uh, about 49, 50% of the people oppose this thing. And uh, there's this sort of a raw fear that Japan might be uh, engaged in uh, dangerous you know, military operations overseas. And I think that is regrettable in terms of Japan's sort of, sort of reluctance to be more cooperative with other countries. But at the same time, it's a good news. I think that the Japanese are not going to be the militarism that, that the world has seen in the past. So in a nutshell, I think that the, basically the news is good. On the one hand, the deterrence is in system, and the United States and Japan and together with other countries are working together. At the same time, uh, we need to continue to work with China very closely, and, and Korea as well. And I think last uh, yesterday's meeting uh, was a very positive step. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly in the news lately, we've had the uh, Philippines appeal to The Hague being accepted on some points. Uh, two questions relating to, to the South China Sea. One, uh, I guess just as a lawyer, what is your assessment of how strong that Philippines case might be? Uh, and then second, as a follow-up, uh, we've seen already how the Republic of China the Taiwanese government played a big role on the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute by reaching a fishing deal with Japan, which made it more complicated uh, on that whole issue for anything more dangerous to occur. Do you foresee their playing a role in the South China Sea as well? Well, my simple answer is I don't know. 
Uh, I think that the Philippine situation and, and Senkaku situation in terms of Taiwan's involvement is a little different. Uh, the, the Taiwan's involvement in the Senkaku area was closely related to the fishing uh, issue. And I think that the, uh, I think frankly speaking, when Taiwan and Japan reached an agreement on the fishery right and allowing Taiwanese fishermen to fish uh, uh, around the Senkaku Island uh, was a very good decision on the part of the Taiwan and also a very good piece of good news for Japan in the sense that uh, it, it sort of separated the territory issue from the fishing issue. My understanding is that traditionally the Taiwanese fishermen have been fishing in that part of the world and I think that the Japanese uh, said, okay, you continue to do that if you are willing to agree on this issue with us. And frankly, I think that there were some mumblings and complaints from the Okinawa fishermen, but let's face it, even in terms of uh, strategic decision, I think it was a marvelous move. I do not know, frankly, whether the Filipino people have some kind of fishing disputes with the Chinese fishermen um, and, and Taiwanese in particular, fish, fishing right conflict there. If there is, perhaps there is room for the Philippines and the Philippines and, and Taiwanese to do the same kind of thing. My sense is that they don't, and so I don't know. In terms of Hague uh, arbitration thing, my understanding is that the, the people realize, and perhaps the Chinese leadership does realize also, that their claim is very weak, and I think that people think that the in two years, uh, that uh, it's more likely that the Philippines will get a more favorable uh, uh, result than, ex uh, than the Chinese expect. This is not my own, based upon my own analysis, I have not been privy to that, but just recently I was at uh, Washington and some experts told me that. All the more reason, I think the next two years will be very crucial in terms of Chinese claim in the South China Sea. If you know, or if the Chinese know that they may have a hard time persuading the arbitration panel, that what they want to do is just set the record straight from their point of view, that this is just purely domestic issues and that uh, they are applying their laws. And I think that we have to be, though I mean, uh, United States and other countries supporting Filipino claims have to be very creative as to what we can do to help the Philippines deal with this thing. Uh, it's, it's going to be very tricky and, and technical. It's not that uh, just mere you know, dispute will be leading to one way. We have to employ some international lawyers actively and, and you know, technically assist the Philippine side. The Filipino government employs some very good international law firms in Washington and elsewhere, and working very hard on that. Okay. Over here, Mike. Uh, Mark Michelson Mark from uh, IMA Asia. Um, I want to ask you something from the J Japanese point of view. Um, you've mentioned the, the opposition to the security bill, whether justified or not. I've seen some polls where it's actually been 60% yeah. or more of the Japanese that are opposed. But still, prime, the Abe administration has taken a very fairly strong view on the Japanese, especially in the East China Sea, uh, the Chinese in the East China Sea. What is the basis of this? We know that Prime Minister Abe is pretty nationalistic. He's got a whole history of that from the family, from the prefecture that he comes from, et cetera. But at the same time, in China, we know that it appears that much of the Chinese population sympathizes with the government's view on these, on these matters. In Japan, it doesn't, at least on the surface, seem that way. Could you explain a little bit more about this? And this isn't whether one side is right or wrong. This is just a question because what we were about, you showed the, the photo of, of, of Japanese warships. Well, I've also seen photos of Japanese and Chinese warships quite close to each other in the East China Sea, and that's a little worrying. Uh, I think that there are two questions. Uh or maybe one question, but the first question was why is so much opposition to this thing? Is Abe sort of uh, pushing this uh, through from his ideological position? And number two is what's happening <laughs> in East Asia, uh, East China Sea. 
with respect to number one question about why that much opposition, actually the highest opposition percentage was before the passage of the law, understandably, but it was quite high and it, perhaps there are a lot of reasons for that. But after the passage of the law, it's going, the, the opposition is slightly going down, but still there is this very strong opposition. Part of the reason is, may I say, in front of all the foreign correspondents, maybe because of the way in which the media cover that issue. And, and, uh, and I think that uh, some of them was not very rational. Uh, and then number two, uh, I think the opposition party characterized this law as a, a, a war legislation rather than peace legislation. And there were some rumors among very wide range of Japanese populace that this is going to lead to conscription. Nothing in the law says anything about it. And there were lots of open public demonstration. I mean, may I say that Japan is a country with the full right of expression and demonstration, unlike some other countries. And so it was very healthy, but it was you know, picked up by media over and over again. And, and so, uh, and plus this constitutional issues that, that the people may have heard about the fact that some people believe that this law is clearly in violation of the way in which the government has interpreted Article 9, which prohibits Japan from using any force uh, as a means of settling international disputes, Army, Navy, Air Force prohibited that kind of thing. And that's very technical, I will not go into that. Uh, interesting side effect of this peace legislation, despite the fact that there is still a very strong opposition, it seems that the Japanese people's interest in self-defense and security issues has increased. I showed you the pictures of naval fleet, and I could have shown hundreds of pictures there. Uh, according to my friends in the Maritime Self-Defense Force, the number of people who have sent uh, uh, application form to be on board this naval fleet have, has doubled. <laughs> and it's like something like 160,000 people wanting to be on board these naval fleet vessels. That's unprecedented. In a very quiet way, the Japanese uh, went through this educational process and tried to see what role Japan should play in terms of East Asia Pacific security. It's not that they are all one bongers. It's not that they are all anti-war. It's just that the ordinary Japanese are trying to see what we should be doing. So in, in that sense, I think it's a nuanced thing. Number two, with respect to Abe's tendency to be nationalistic, I don't know what his ideology is. I don't talk to him every day, so I don't know. I don't know him personally that well. I met him several times. Regardless of whatever, he thinks about this thing, regardless of his motive, I don't want to speculate. But the truth of the matter is that the Chinese never showed any interest in Senkaku until 1972, until the natural resources were rediscovered. Uh, and number three, uh, I think that the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force and Japan on the whole has shown incredible sort of uh, level of restraint in responding to the, the Chinese, may I say, provocation. Uh, it was the Chinese who came into that area. Well, of course they claim that that's theirs. But if that's theirs, they, you know, they, they, that's, that has been theirs for a long time. But now for the first time, over the past three years or so, they were coming into the, our territory water en masse. And uh, sometimes there were some instances in which the, the, the Chinese, uh, the, the Navy vessel, uh, locked the radar on the, the Japanese Maritime Safety Defense Force vessels. There were some occasions in which the, the Chinese jet fighter just provoked the Japanese fighters. In, the truth of the matter is that the Japanese have always been trying to let the Maritime Safety Defense Japanese Navy behind and the Coast Guards of Japan have dealt with that. And I think in that restraint uh, has helped to m endure that tension and lure. 
people are talking about some kind of mechanism in the future, and the Chinese now realize that they cannot do this bullying thing forever. So it, 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 I think yesterday, is, in a nutshell, what they have agreed is not to, to agree on the fact that, well, they have done this already uh, previously, but they have agreed not to, uh, to disagree on certain things. And I think that the Senkan could be separated from all the things that we need to do together. So I don't necessarily think that it's just nationalistic ambition that the, you know, every nation has a certain territorial claim. I understand that. But I have sat on the, uh, the, the government-sponsored uh, meeting on how to explain the Senkaku issue to the worldwide uh, you know, audience, and I think that I am convinced that we have a very good case. Edith, please. Hi, thank you for your very interesting talk. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the educational process that you see in Japan. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, um, a former senior advisor to uh, Nakasone wrote a book about how security was taboo. Uh, I was a taboo. The word itself was taboo. It had basically been excised from the Japanese public uh, sphere in the post-war era. Um, in the former downtown headquarters of the self-defense forces, uh, officers took off their uniforms when they left the grounds. Um, I once talked with a uh, Japanese uh, vice admiral um, at uh, Sasebo who said that he couldn't even tell his family members what he did. They just weren't interested. So there was this post-war, not blind spot exactly, but real, real denial that there was such a thing even as the, even that there was such a thing as the uh, self-defense forces. So how is that changing, and and why? Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful question because this is exactly what I uh, wanted to talk, but I didn't have time to spend on. So uh, I'm very happy. This is sort of a historical historical background of where we are in terms of self-defense force today, as opposed to 30, 40 years ago. Um, History, history issues, and everybody talks about history issues. Uh, I think it's clearly the case that the Japanese regret what happened or what the Japanese did all over Asia 70 years ago and prior to that. And, and I think everybody was resolved, including the emperor and the leadership of Japan, never shall we be doing the same thing again. In fact, if you read the August 14 statement by Prime Minister Abe, on the eve of the 17th anniversary of the surrender of Japan to the Allied powers in 1945, uh, it clearly uh, states that with deep sense of remorse and, and uh, repenting that uh, we regret very and clearly uh, uh, what terrible things that we did, not only to the Japanese people, but also to the people of Asia uh, and so forth and so on. Now, because of that sentiment, uh, either you're right or left, that we never will do the same thing, militaristic, adventuristic invasion. And in fact, that uh, Prime Minister Abe used the word invasion in that statement. Uh, I think that the reaction to that was the military is a bad thing. So Article 9 was actually not imposed by the Americans. It was, in a way, imposed. But, but it was welcome by the Japanese, that we will never again have uh, any war against anybody uh, with some qualifications. Uh, the government's position and my position that we have the right of self-defense. Now, having said that, you're right that the, because of that thing, when the Cold War heated up in 1950 and 51, that there was this predecessor of self-defense forces born, and they were basically ostracized in the community uh, some of the children of self-defense force uh, members were bullied at schools because your father is a military. You know that's a bad, bad, bad thing. And Okinawa, in particular, uh, because of the, the sort of some unfortunate incidents there, particularly the army, uh, the ground self-defense force people, their children were not able to go to public schools in Okinawa for a long time. Now. You know, switching that to 
2011, 2012-13, uh, gradually, I think that the Japanese people, through the education, through incidents, have proved themselves to be a professional, and be very self-disciplined, and C, totally unmilitaristic, and D, willing to help the Japanese people in case of uh, national emergency, both in terms of security concerns, but also in disaster relief and that context. Uh, today's poll show that I will ask if which institution they respect uh, among many institutions in Japan. Self-defense force at one point in time was number one. Uh, and this is so particularly after the 311 earthquake tsunami issues. In fact, a number of young Japanese who volunteered to work for the self-defense force has increased particularly in the disaster area. Why? Because they saw particularly ground self-defense force, but also Navy and Air Force people dedicated and, and risking their lives to help those who suffer there and who were washed away by tsunami. And there, there were some news scenes on television where small children, they knew that a bunch of go, go, ground self-defense force people will pass by their house. And it was every day these two brothers waving to the ground self-defense force people. Now, I'm not glorifying self-defense force. I'm not glorifying them at all. I think that there are some weaknesses and, and nobody can be perfect. But I think overall, they are very professional, dedicated, and have no idea of uh, doing the kind of things that the Japan did back in the 1930s and 40s. And that's regardless of whoever the leader is. They are obliged to follow the political leadership and it's very strict about it, but they have a much bigger role. And we have to sort of face the reality, today's situation, that's why the new security legislation was passed. Uh, if they remain to be as professional and, and as superb as they are, I think uh, they will do fine. In fact, the United States Armed Forces respect the Japanese Self-Defense Force very highly. Maybe I'm just being too Japanese on these things, and you may criticize me for being too biased about that. You can criticize me for that. Boy, we have a lot of questions. We're running out of time. Uh, we'll take one here, and then we'll try to take some others quickly. Thank you. Um, ben Bland from the Financial Times. Um, you mentioned the US um, freedom of navigation operation and said it would deter China. But do you think it will really deter China, or will it just be the latest act in a cycle of escalation. Um, and secondly, people often talk about the South China Sea as being a threat to the world because of global trade, so much of which passes through these seas. But is there actually any threat to freedom of navigation for civilian vessels and for trade? Or is this purely a fight between militaries and over some potential oil and gas and fishing resources? Please. Very quickly, uh, I think that the first question was, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just was thinking. Simple question, I don't know, but I hope it does. And I think separate from that issue, I think in terms of uh, credibility of US forces, uh, Obama administration has had some issues with that in the case of Syria and other issues. But I think this is showing uh, Obama administration's determination, regardless whether this will have a tangible deterrence effect or not, to show not necessary only to the Chinese, but also to the allies, that they do value international law, rule of law. They do value the relationship with the friends in the area, and that they do uh, adhere to that and they take action. And I think that's very important. Uh, once they do that, then I think they have to stick to that position. That's separate from whether or not this will have a tangible effect upon China's future. 
And I, my sense is that Chinese care about the international public opinion as well, I think, that they can afford not to. Number two question is whether this will be a, a real threat to the world. Uh, my sense is that this in and of itself may not be, but you know, this is where East China Sea and South China Sea, cyber issue and space issue all come together. It's not only that we are talking about South China Sea situation, but what in the world China is trying to do? What in the world the Chinese leadership is doing vis-a-vis -vis their military uh, cohort? Are they in control of what they are trying to do? Are they really willing to be part of the international community or rather they are ready to take any chance that they, there is available either in the East China Sea, either in the South China Sea or in the in cyber. Uh, it's interesting that uh, they are trying to be friends with the United States every time Xi Jinping goes to China, I mean the United States, and, and they are very good diplomats, I, I have to say. But at the same time, putting all things together, we have to be uh, uh, very uh, alerted and we have to be careful. I think it's very clear that we all have to live with China, particularly Hong Kong people. I mean, you live next door to, to them. You can't imagine. I mean, I, you may wish that if there's any mechanical machine to separate the Hong Kong Island further away into the sea, but I, I don't think there's anything like that. So Japan is the same way. We have to live with the Japan, Chinese, and we are willing to do that, but at the same time, we have to be careful as to what they are going to do next in the whole context of the thing. It's just not just South China Sea. Oh, wait. Um, we are now at the end of time, but maybe if you can, each of you, just ask your question just a moment, and then we'll try to get those brief reply, if we can, from our guest. Hi, Chris Appleton. You touched on Japanese-Korean relations, um, which are very frustrating, I think, for the Americans. Do you think, from the point of view of Japan's domestic situation, there's any chance of a, a kind of an open-hearted gesture over Takashima Doctor, or anything else? And over here as well, please. Just what weight do you give to economic growth rates in, in how the security situation in East Asia emerges. China grown at 5% for the last 30 years. So I suspect this conversation would be a much shorter one, for instance. So you're, you're, so Japan big. doesn't grow faster, and China continues to grow fast. In the end, armies march on their stomachs, as Napoleon said. They need money. Let me try to answer those questions very quickly. Korea, Japan. Uh, yesterday's meeting was very significant because more than Chinese. I mean, the Chinese Premier and Chinese leadership and the Japanese Premier uh, have met and talked, and there has been tangible sort of progress in terms of Sino-Japanese relationship. One of the greatest lines that I have liked over the past three years or so is this agree to disagree, and, and that's a very positive sign. And I think the Koreans felt that they were left alone, and I think that it was more Korea uh, than Japan that changed uh, its mind, and President Park in particular uh, was persuaded that this is a time, this is time that, that she talk and meet together with uh, Premier Lee with Japan. Uh, now, you have to remember that we have had a very complicated relationship for the past 150 years with Korea, but you have to also remember prior to uh, Imunbak's uh, landing on Takeshima some years ago, uh, Korea was very popular in Japan, and I think Japanese were mistakenly believing that the Korea and Japan are so close to each other. Uh, Korea has developed economically so tremendously, and the youngsters in Korea and Japan are becoming closer and closer. I, I think that then it was a sort of a surprise for Japan, for the Koreans to uh, to show that they are still displeased with the way in which we handle Takeshima issue and comfort women issue, and that will continue on. But I have always told my Korean uh, friends and Korean students of mine, uh, 
a lot of them are in Japan, that uh, I think you have uh, causes to complain about what Japan has done and what Japan is doing today. It's precisely because we are neighbors. Um, Jesus Christ said, "Thy love thy neighbor, and that's the most difficult thing to do, I think. Uh, but at the same time, we should be able and mature enough to be able to do things together uh, in many ways. Korea and Japan have always been supplementary to each other in terms of doing things together. I think that uh, I don't think that there is any need for Japan to be saying something about Takeshima. Uh, Korean friends of mine do know that it's irritating Japan continue to say that's our territory. They know that Japan will never resort to uh, use of force to get that island back. In fact, it was Korea in 1946 or 7 that resorted to the use of force to get the island back to them. Uh, number two, comfort women, I think that uh, it's a touchy issue and it's a painful issue for Koreans. I do understand that. But I think, again, overall, uh, Koreans are asking us to sort of change the way in which we uh, treat treaties and peace treaties and that kind of things. And I think that it's, it, if, if we uh, agree to do some compensation and that kind of things, uh, officially, that would be in violation of the international law precedents. And in fact, the similar issues uh, happened when I was a minister at the uh, Embassy of Japan in Washington DC. Lots of former POWs, uh, American POWs, sued the Japanese companies and, and asked that they be compensated. All the, the former secretaries of state of the United States sided with Japan. That's done. Let's not do that. And, and I think that's the same way. Simply in terms of moral obligation and everything else, I do believe that Japan will forever continue to think about this sort of past. And I, I am completely uh, in line with the, the, some of the sentiments that Koreans have in terms of diplomatic international law issues. I don't think that there will be any chance that Japan will uh, officially, officially uh, pay back the things that uh, we agreed that we have settled. Well, on that note, on uh, hopes for regional peace, but also, I guess, legal limits to expressions uh, of regret, uh, we'd like to uh, give you something to remember the club by, as we do with uh, all of our visitors. Uh, thank you very much thank for coming. You. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all. We hope to see some of you either at tomorrow's evening's event on 3D printing or next Monday's uh, documentary on American foreign correspondence. Thank you again.